you just cited data. The people who hold these positions, they don't give a shit about data. Right. If they gave a shit about data, they wouldn't hold the positions, <laughs> right? So it's never a gotcha. So that's the always a fascinating thing when I look online or I talk to someone, you know, like you is super educated and super smart. And, 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 and they present data and people, you know, watching this will say like, oh, wow, look at that. Like, you know, that's a gotcha for those people. That's no gotcha for them. No. That they don't accept any, it doesn't matter. There is no evidence. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. Today I spoke with Eric Kaufman. He's a professor of politics at the University of Buckingham. We talked about a wide range of things. We talked about immigration, the UK, the differences between the UK and the United States. We made very specific predictions about critical social justice, what we think are gonna happen, and then we bet on those predictions. So we're gonna revisit those at six months and we'll see who takes whom out to dinner. Welcome, Eric Kaufman, to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. Thanks for coming out here, driving your bike out here. Yeah, well, public transport wasn't uh, exactly happening easily, so I decided to hop on the bike. Yeah, I've been caught a couple of times, but there have been, you know, 10, well, no, no, maybe more than 10, 15 to 25 minutes. So you're American. I'm Canadian, but oh, Canadian. I, I'm, I'm not far from Portland, up in Vancouver, so yeah. Yeah. I, uh, uh, and how long have you been in London? I've been here forever, like over 25 years. Holy yeah. shit. When was the last time you went back to the U.S.? Um, well, U.S. and Canada, I usually go once a year. So, yeah, I, I'm there quite frequently. I was in New, New York and Florida, I guess, a couple months ago. Do you go back to the U.S. and Canada enough to see the degradation? To There's a difference, and, and it's interesting, like Canada, the U.S., I, I, there are differences there too, but I think that to some degree Canada's in the middle. Um, but yeah, urban centers in in America, you really have a lot of disorder. Uh, yeah, and you see it, I guess, with the homeless issue, which is growing in Canada. Okay, by so the way. that's the other yeah. thing: homelessness, yeah. drug addiction, fentanyl, opioids, yeah. tent camping. That's the thing. You know, you go into the shops here; no one assumes that you're going to steal things. Right. In Portland. I mean, I don't live in Portland. I moved, but they have some of the big, you know, supermarkets, Fred Meyer, Safeway. They literally, I'm not kidding you, I'm not kidding you. They literally put carts so that people can't run out with goods. Can I tell you a quick story? You want to hear a quick story? Yeah. Very quick. Then we'll, we'll get into the meeting <laughs> thing. So my son came home and I um, uh, f flew back to Portland to spend some time with him. And we had to go to the grocery store in the evening. And I said to him, without any exaggeration, five or six out of 10 times when I come to the grocery store in the evening, I only go in the evening, so I don't know what it's like in the day. Someone will steal something and there'll be a commotion. And as I was telling him this, literally seconds after I finished telling him the story, someone stole something. And I said, well, there you go. Maybe it's seven out of 10. So we walked around the store and we did, <laughs> this is a totally true story. We walked around our, the store, we did our thing. We're in the checkout line and this is kind of commotion. And what had happened was someone else uh, had stolen something when we were in the back of the store. And the security guard yelled at the woman who stole something and said, you know, stop, you know, leave, whatever. He said, I mean, I didn't hear it. And she ran out of the Safeway and her boyfriend came into the Safeway and started screaming at the security guard for yelling at his girlfriend to <laughs> stop stealing things. Boy. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, would you would you see that here? No, you you wouldn't see. There's there's none of none of that brazenness uh, here. No. What issues do you think we should focus on today? What should we be talking about? What do people need to know? Uh, well, I think two. Th I think culture wars are key, and I think okay. the whole nexus of multiculturalism, immigration, national identity is another, and and that's behind a lot of the politics and the political divisions we're seeing in the West. So let's talk, let's talk about uh, multiculturalism. How do you define that? Well, multiculturalism is essentially a belief in emphasizing difference rather than what people have in common. And it's also um, a belief in a more group-based rights approach rather than a kind of colorblind individual universal rights approach. And so it's, it doesn't actually matter necessarily 
what the composition of your population is. I mean, this is often a mistake that's been made, and we see this in the British press where uh, there's this, this big row over some people saying multiculturalism has failed and others saying, oh, you're, you don't like people who aren't white, essentially. No, uh, multiculturalism is a way of managing ethnic relations that's different from the melting pot and assimilation. It's the opposite. Or it's like the mixed salad metaphor as opposed to the... Yeah, it's kind of melting pot versus salad bowl in the extreme, right? One is, you know, one says, let's emphasize how we're different, celebrate differences. The other is, no, we're going to celebrate what we have in common. Okay, so what's the relationship between multiculturalism and diversity? Well, essentially, you have a certain level of diversity in your society, let's say, and that's the number of different ethnic groups there, relative size and composition. That's diversity. If we just stick to ethnic diversity, the second issue is how you manage that ethnic diversity and how you envision that coming together. Do you want people to emphasize their differences and celebrate them, or do you want them to essentially do their differences in private and emphasize the commonality of the national identity? That's a, what we might call the assimilationist or republican or civic nationalist approach as distinct from multiculturalism, which is to lean into the identity differences and make that central to defining the country. The identity differences. Yeah. I've often wondered if the reason that people say diversity is our strength and that's become a mantra it is precisely because they know it's not true. <laughs> right. I mean, if they knew it was true, they wouldn't have to say it. But beyond, beyond that... What an empty platitude. It's not even a platitude, a cliche. I don't even know what it is. Well, yeah, the, thing is, you... the thing is, there is pretty good research on that, which shows that, in fact, it's not the case, really. So, I mean, if we're talking about ethnic diversity, for example, yeah. the most diverse societies are largely in sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, ethnically diverse countries, uh, as well as Papua New Guinea, a thousand right. languages, I'm and there's a few other that. places. Yeah, yeah. So you've got... Those countries, and essentially the more ethnically diverse societies, even within Africa, um, generally speaking, it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, have had less economic development. I mean, there was a famous paper that compared East Asia, which generally fairly homogenous countries, and Sub-Saharan Africa, it's more ethnically uh, diverse. And it, you said that explained like 40% of the differences in their economic development trajectory from the 1970s, let's say. So, yeah, I think the, because when you have a highly diverse society, politics is more likely to run on ethnic lines. It's harder to agree where to put the hospital, the school, the factory, you name it. It's fought over by different groups. Whereas when, when it's less diverse, politics can take a more left versus right form and there's disagreements over policy. I mean, it would seem to be just, we, we don't, we don't have to perseverate on this, but yeah. it, it would seem to me to be demonstrably false that diversity is our strength. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, th there is, there is like a small sliver of truth in the sense that intellectual diversity. That's not what they mean. No, it isn't. But even, really, even yeah. that I would, I would argue that's not true. I remember when years and years ago, I kept hearing that mantra, diversity is our strength. And I said, if that's true, why don't you get someone who doesn't know anything about math to head the math department? Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and it's just, okay, but k kidding aside, you know, and I've made the point repeatedly, like nobody talks about diversity on professional sports teams. And then Vivek Ramaswamy tweeted out something like that recently. But um, if, if you have people coming from a culture of say genocidal Jew hatred. It, why would having those people? Why would including that culture into the milieu be a strength for the society? I agree. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, like I mean, it's just a sincere yeah, yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, uh, you're right. I mean, I'm sure in in some universe there may be a problem where you know what's associated with that may be useful. I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe if you have to go to war against somebody, I don't know. Um, but no, I guess where I think the case has been made is more, um, get, you know, where they do these experiments about guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and there where you, you, you take the average of everybody's guess is almost as good as the best guess. And so the argument is everyone sees the problem slightly differently. So there's a certain wisdom in in a diverse crowd that can be if you can aggregate it in a certain way but that's uh, but i think with a lot of these things 
that, you know, it only goes so far and the downsides kick in beyond a certain point. And so I, I like to think of an optimal, optimal level of diversity and, and not as diversity as some unalloyed good, which is the way it's presented right. now. We right. have to talk about what is the, what is the level that we want that's optimal for human flourishing? And if we're above that level, we've got to reduce it through assimilation. Um, so yeah. if we could wave a magic wand, what would we want the UK to look like in terms of ethnic difference? Well, I would say I would say that it needs to slow the ethnic change rate down. And so by constricting immigration, I mean, I think the current mix is fine, but I think that, you know, if it moves considerably more in the direction of greater diversity, I don't think that will improve human flourishing in Britain, no. Okay, okay. So, you know, I had Toby Young here, and I was talking to him, mm. and I just, help me understand something. You know who, you know Gad Sad? Yeah. Gad's a buddy of mine. I heard him say. I've met Gad. Yeah, I think he yeah. said this to me once. He said, if tomorrow the country of, of Vietnam was consumed by genocidal Jew hatred, would it be rational to limit immigration from Vietnam? Right. I pose that question to you. Well, yes, is the answer. Well, that does not seem like a radical conclusion to make. Hmm. I mean, forget Jews. If the country of, 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 of Nepal was consumed by a genocidal hatred of, I don't know, insert ethnic minority of your choice in which you have some of them in your country... Would it be rational to limit immigration from Nepal? I mean, I, I just, I cannot think of a greater no-brainer. Like, right. why would you want to import people who are genocidal maniacs into your country? Right, right. Now, I guess- Or the, am I missing something? If well, I'm missing something, yeah. maybe they, maybe you have to make an argument, oh, well, you know, they're really good plumbers, or they right. can, they have a radical disproportionate contribution to, you know, the arts or industry. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the the pushback you'll probably get as well. They're not you know, if if you take, for example, I don't know, Muslims or is it Arab Muslims or whatever. Are, are only some of them would hold those that degree of of, of hatred, right? I mean, it. Although I, you know, obviously the opinion surveys show considerable you know anti-Semitic prejudice, but whether it reaches quite that extreme, um, you know. But but in any case, I think the issue is we need to be talking about numbers. We need to be talking about reductions and and and. For these cultural reasons, I think that's perfectly legitimate. Um, now, you know, there's people who would say, oh, but that's, you know, discrimination. And I think here's a, a point that I always try and bring across is a country's relationship to the rest of the world yeah. is a bit like the relationship of a club like the Sons of Italy to oh. American society. They get to choose membership. It's a free association principle. Right. It's not the same as you're in a bank and you don't serve a black customer, right? You can't discriminate against your fellow citizens because it's equality, equal treatment under the law, but you actually can discriminate when it comes to membership criteria for your society. That is actually legitimate. It is not the same problem as discriminating in terms of a bank. Um, and these two things have been squashed together. Uh, and that's- Me Membership you know, criteria. Yeah, associational inclusion or exclusion and there's a there's an interesting paper on this by a political philosopher called Chris Wellman in 2008, and actually quite a very good journal that says, well, actually, nations actually have free associations. They can join something like the European Union. They can break out of the European Union, and they can determine membership criteria, and all of that is within liberal theory. So this notion that you can't discriminate on cultural grounds is simply not borne out. Uh, okay. In, yeah. So you got a bunch of things going on there. So, you know, discrimination from the Latin discriminare to weed out. Mm. We discriminate. You, you just, I, I, we made, I made us tea. I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing well in this. Uh, um, You're a Brit. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm learning the customs of the people here, but you didn't put um, antifreeze. So you discriminated against antifreeze in your tea, as did I. Right. So discrimination is a fundamental part of how we live our lives from the moment in a practical sense, from when we wake up. Absolutely right, yeah. I mean, of course, I think, you know, we, we have an understanding of equal treatment in terms of public accommodations and in terms of public facing institutions, right? So there, I think equality law makes sense where we, we, you know, you have categories you don't discriminate against. 
But yeah, in our private lives, of course oh. we do. Yeah. Oh, okay, so let's go to the macro level okay. again. So you do not have to answer any of my questions if they make <laughs> you uncomfortable. Or if you just don't no, want to No, that's the fun. <laughs> so I'm going to pose a hypothetical to you. Let's say that I could demonstrate to you. I can't. But let's just say that I could demonstrate to you, to your satisfaction, that the people of South Korea universally have lower IQs than almost anybody in the world, hovering at this around 70 on a Gaussian distribution at 100 being the norm, 140 being genius, 60 being, I don't know what the classification is anymore, but we, we used to classify it as uh, retarded. Um, and I could show you that just 10 points above that classification. Would it be rational for people mm -hmm. to limit immigration from South Korea? If we know that that correlates to other metrics for success in society. Yeah, I mean, it would be, I suppose. I, I guess the question is how, um, you know, how solid, how solidly do we know these things, right? I mean, I suppose that would be um, the argument. Is it, do, you know, how, is this genetic? Is this environmental? Well, let's right. wave some wands. Okay. Let's wave a wand in one world. We accept by fiat that it's extraordinarily well studied, that right. it's genetic. The next world, we're not sure, maybe, and the next world, it's cultural. Mm. Would it matter, and would the, should we restrict immigration on one axis but not another? Well, it probably would in the sense that over generations, you'd expect the culture to um, assimilate, let's say, the people for whom the low IQ is environmental. Um, so I guess okay. you could say it, it, perhaps that would be, be a different decision than the one where you were sure that it was somehow genetic. Um, obviously, there'll be many other considerations in terms, you know, right? Uh, countries obviously have low skill and high skill immigration, for example. See, that's the thing yeah. that no one talks about. Yeah. 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 And, and so they're already making these decisions partly on the basis of, oh, well, we we have a need in low skill. And we don't have a need in high skill. So so like Britain, for example, has opened up low skill more in the last few years, uh, even though they said they wouldn't do that it, they could have not done possible. that. What is the yeah. data on that? Could not. Po I don't know the data. It's not my right. domain of expertise, but I could not imagine that that's good. Well, no. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, the, the way it's justified is well, that just there's this huge labor shortage, um, which may or may not be true if the wages were to rise, right? Um, but I think the question is well, are they low skill because they come from a poor country and and that's why they're low skill or are they, and so they haven't had a chance to rise or are they low skill because of these innate factors you talk about? And that's, that's going to be critical, but, but you're right that over time, the contribution, you know, it's going to take time for their true contribution, even if it's just purely environmental, why they have lower skill, it'll take time for them to achieve the same as a high skilled person over maybe a couple of generations. So how would we know, how would we know, what was causing groups to be low skilled or what are, I'm trying to think like, how would we know that? I mean, I suppose people coming from Iraq or Syria that have had a bombed out of infrastructure didn't have yeah. the capabilities. Um, yeah. I mean, let, yeah. let me flip the question on you. Let's say that there's a group of people we know who have IQs well below, well, well above the mean. Like we know every time I, you know, one says something like this, the attests are attacked or something, but we, we know it's pretty well researched. It's extraordinarily well researched. We know from twin studies, et cetera. I mean, obviously I'm thinking of Ashkenazi Jews, but I'm not going to say it, but let's say that they were, you know, um, Sri Lankans. Would it not, or would it be rational to have an immigration policy that privileged or favored Sri Lankans in some way? Well, Probably, but again, it I guess it depends what the aims of the society are. So, for example, yeah. um, if it's just about having the best economy or the highest per capita income, yeah. then you would pursue that. But if there was a if you know if there was a cultural distance, let's say from these high IQ people, um, you may say, well, we'll we'll take a slightly lower GDP in order to have less of a you know, less of a shift in our cultural composition. So okay. it depends what your that. trade-off no, no, is between that. those things, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. So let, let me throw another curveball at you, if I may. All right. So I read that 
if you norm out the uh, acceptance to Harvard and you don't look at any other variables, um, for example, in other words, the, what I'm really trying to say is in a politic way, you don't, <laughs> race is not a consideration in admissions. Asians, cold climate Asians, would constitute over 51% of the students at Harvard. Um, to be Asians, whites take a slight dip, Hispanics take it a, a great dip, and African Americans plummet to, I think, 0.9%, so not even 1 in 100. I tweeted out something like, What's the problem? I'm a big believer in the meritocracy. I tweeted, tweeted out something like, What's the problem with having? over 51% of Asians in the graduating classes of, or not even the graduate, in, in our elite institutions. And I was excoriated online. What, but I'm serious, like, what is the problem with that? <laughs> well, right. So, so the question, I suppose, is again, what's the society driving at? Is it to maximize total productivity, get the most out of the resources, human resources you have, then you'd let Asians go to 51% or whatever. If... However, it's about some kind of symbolic representation. That's when you'd introduce the quotas. I mean, I almost think, so for example, Northern Ireland, like places that have had ethnic conflicts, yeah. um, Northern Ireland has a 50-50 Catholic Protestant recruitment into its police force. Now, it may be that Catholics are better cops and, and you know, but it's 50-50. Um, now, you can say, well, that's good for social peace or that's you know, important for political representation. Is, now, I, but that's a group a based, difference. That's a that's a kind of multicultural group rights based principle rather than a colorblind universal. No, I'm kind of you know, I could almost be persuaded like we can have some of this representative stuff, but let's not pretend that's okay. somehow moral. That's a second okay. issue. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna yeah. push back on okay. that. Okay. So that assumes that there's some kind of intrinsic difference between individuals based upon those immutable characteristics. Like, I see no, I would be utterly flabbergasted if there were a difference between Catholic and Protestant police officers right. in terms of like number of arrests, whatever by whatever metrics one is judging success by. But these institutions are specifically, emphatically, you know, they're the elite institutions, but they're not discharging their mission of taking the best students because they have another... Their mission is corrupted by an ideology. Right. Well, yeah, but I, see, I think you could. Or, okay, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to take the sort of yeah. devil's advocate position. Please, so yeah. it might be to say, well, let's just say the best politicians all live in California and Texas. Okay. Um, and and so we're going to have all of the House of you know representatives and Congress to be from those states. Uh, and we're not going to bother with a Senate where it's the same number of senators per state, right? So we're, we're actually just going to say it's one country. We don't care about state identity. And so maybe a whole bunch of states will be hugely underrepresented in terms of their numbers. You know, so... so I see I, what you're I, getting I, at. You see, there's, there's, there is a principle that says, well, we need to have some representation from all the states to keep them on side, to keep them... I, you know, I, I understand yeah. the principle... But again, the difference is that unless you want to argue that running a campaign is itself a kind of merit meritocratic feature of the system in which the best candidates rise. I mean, you could certainly make that mm -hmm. argument, yeah. but we're, we're, we're talking about something very different. We're talking about a discrete objective metric. Let me, let me just give you an example. For me. I watched a great documentary. I think it was on Netflix. It was called um, The World's Strongest Man. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No. Fantastic, but there's one thing this guy says, and they're talk the the the, the doc documentarians are going around, and they're interviewing people who want to be the world's strongest man, and this guy says the coolest thing. He's like, you know what, bodybuilding is bullshit, and what's when you're the world's strongest man, when you're a bodybuilder, if you're like you know a Phil Heath, I think is the Mr. Olympia now, or Dorian Yates, or who you know Lee Lebron, whoever it was, you have a bunch of people telling you that you have the best physique. But when you are the world's strongest man, there's just a number. H how much did you squat? I mean, you can weigh those variables differently in terms of 
entrance to who matriculate, who gets accepted to an Ivy League. But I mean, if you look at the S at the mean SAT scores, I mean, there's no BSing that. So I, I don't, I'm not <laughs> sure I buy that parallel between the politicians because one is a, at least ostensibly a pure, purely meritocratic process. Or am I miss, if I'm missing well, well, something, let me know. Well, I'm just thinking through, could it be that if you had, you know, a higher quality of politician from certain parts of the country than from others, in terms of forming executives, decision making, yeah. et cetera, uh, or even in the bureaucracy, whether, you know, do you need representation from more regions or can it all be from DC? You know, I, I mean, I guess there's an argument to say because people have collective identities as well as their own sense of individuality, yeah. that you kind of want to have some kind of balance of these collective identities to not get, because a lot of people will think in identitarian terms, Agreed, you know, yeah. uh, so, so in Northern Ireland, yeah. you know, the Catholic, Catholics vote for Catholic parties. Protestants voted for Protestant parties. Catholics lost every election because they were the minority for right. 50 years. So eventually they got a bit cheesed off. That's an example of where you, and then so they said, okay, yeah, well, we'll have this PR system. And so they'll have more or less the same share of their population represented in the legislature. Now, I mean, I think there is some some merit behind that, but I, the mistake I think is we we kind of see that as kind of an immoral imperative, which That's it isn't. exactly it's where just, I was going. It's right. just, okay, for social peace, for representation will do it, but let's not pretend that this is somehow a moral imperative because it's actually probably going against what should be done, which right. is a purely meritocratic system. So let's talk about that for a second because your mm. second point that you made was what you just reiterated, the, the moral point. So given that, and again, if you're a private institution, you can do whatever you want. Federally funded institutions, I, I think we can distinguish between those. We could... Mm, lay out that those sets of syllogisms for why they should be treated differently. But why not be honest about what you do? Yeah. We, we, yeah. we, we do not accept, we, we, we do, there is systemic discrimination. And if you're Asian, you need X number of points more. I mean, there've been case after case, people have gotten perfect SAT scores who are Asian who are denied and they have a personality index right. or something. <laughs> right. like but right. why not be honest? Why not be honest? We are seeking proportional representation. And that by definition means that we will accept people of a certain identity group who would otherwise not be qualified to occupy these positions. Okay, so, and I'm making that statement to you because then you wouldn't have to conceal, you wouldn't have to hide your true aim. And already there's a crisis of legitimacy in the institutions because they failed to discharge their primary mission. And in this particular case, they've completely demeaned the meritocracy. In fact, they've taken, I was going to use a vulgarity, but they've demeaned the meritocracy. Let right. us leave it at that. But at least you'd then be honest about it. Yeah, because you could say, well, <coughs> for political reasons, we've got to have this mix. Right. I'm sure there are some committees you know, in Congress where they say, for political reasons, we need to have somebody from California and somebody from the Plains states and somebody from the South or whatever. I mean, you had the Dixiecrats and they had to yeah, be involved. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, political reasons, we have to have this mix. And I think, you know, these identities are important to people, so we got to do it. I think that would be a better justification than to pretend that this is somehow fair. Do you think that much of the anti-woke space is becoming a Christian nationalist space and is becoming an echo chamber, and are you seeing, is anything about it concerning a war? You're laughing. No, no, I, it's, go on, sorry. No, 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 I mean, it's just funny to hear the <laughs> the echo chamber, anti-woke space. I, I think that's that's actually not quite right. I think there are different frequencies within the anti-woke movement. Um, I mean, you can see, I, I reviewed, for example, recently in Law and Liberty, I did a review of, of Rufo and Hanania's book, and oh, then yeah, I did yeah. a, roof, a, a review of Yasha Monk and, and Lukianov and Ricky Schlott's books. Oh, I read all of those except the, um, the, the middle one, yeah. Well, and, and you can see a, you know, a clear, clear difference between the more conservative books and the more classical liberal books. Classical liberals are very uncomfortable, for example, with things like banning CRT in school, critical race theory in schools. They don't want government intervention into the institutions. And you know what Rufo's argument for that is, right? 
Bruford's argument is the whole thing is government intervention. I mean, it's a government school. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and I guess, you know, I think that you could even make a case though for some intervention, even into the private sector where they're engaging, for example, in, in algorithmic viewpoint discrimination and, and this sort of thing. Um, so, but yeah, that's yeah, a separate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, separate yeah. topic. But yeah, I think that, yeah, I tend to lean on the sort of Hanania Rufo side when it comes to government intervention. I, I think that's, you have to. I think it's the only way to address corrupt institu- institutions that have become ideologically corrupted. Um, and that's, and I kind of liken it more to protecting citizens. Yeah. So the, sometimes the government has a role in protecting citizens from institutions. And this is a, a point that liberals, they, they forget the deep history of liberalism going back to Hobbes, going back to the early Locke, where part of the social contract, the government was about protecting your liberties mm. from private violence, from private illiberalism. And we're kind of in that more in that mode now where there's private censorship from tech firms and or from universities or from uh, your employer or, you know, these sorts of things are increasing. And the role of elected, transparent, democratic government is, I would argue, to regulate that kind of discrimination. Um, Yeah, I'm extremely sympathetic to that. And my liberal hackles are raised when we talk about banning things. But I think... And maybe there's no but there. Maybe it's an and. And I think there's a kind of insincerity and my side bias and rank tribalism when it comes to the specific issues. For, so, for example, if I said, if phrenology were institutionalized tomorrow in the school system in Mississippi, I don't know why I picked on them. I probably should have picked <laughs> someone in the north. In in Minnesota, um, I have a thousand people from Mississippi telling me I'm like biased <laughs> against people from Mississippi. The phrenology analogy is... Uh, similar to critical social justice. M- Do you think most people would want that removed? They would, and, and it would be removed. Okay, so and let's say there were bitter fights over that, I, and I'm, I, I'm thinking of evolution and creationism, but that's, that's in the back of my mind, but it's not what I'm thinking of. I'm actually thinking of phenology, so this isn't right. like a... This is what I'm actually thinking about. So if Nazi race science... Right. We're taught, right? Yeah. So the same people saying things the state shouldn't have a right to remove it would be demanding that the state had a right to remove it. Absolutely they would. Yeah. So I just think it's a kind of disingenuine, fallacious, my side bias. I, I think you're absolutely correct. You know, they would find a, a, a rationalization for it. And, and I would agree with that rationalization, by the way. But But essentially they would say, well, the democracy determines the curriculum. We're not right. banning. We're just making decisions to include or exclude from the curriculum. And and so if you think of a school library, the librarian decides what to include and exclude into a physical, there's a limited physical capacity, limited budget. There are then rules and guidance on what to include and what to exclude. Now that we don't call banning, but in effectively those rules right. and guidelines are bans. And so the, the rules and guidelines are now coming from the state of Florida rather than from your particular school board or librarian. Uh, that's so, all. so what principles do you think apply to what should and should not be banned in a K through 12 education? Well, I think that the um, electorate and the, the democratically elected government uh, if they are elected on a ticket that says, this is how we're going to shape the curriculum, yeah. I think they should have the latitude to shape the curriculum. And if people don't like that, they can vote them out the next time. Right now, of course, there's, there's going so to be no a, principles. What's just, that? No principles, just vote. Well, I mean, I know what principles I hold to. You know, they should, I think this should be a politically neutral space as much as possible. But of course, if I, I do. Sh- support the idea that we should actually have a democratic say over what is taught in the schools. So those are contradictory. One is universalizable and one yeah. is not, right? Well, one's an ideal in civil society that that I would like to fight for, a norm I'd like to fight for. But procedurally, I would support uh, democratic decision-making over, over the content. Um, so, really? you know, yeah. Even Nazi I, race science. Well, if that's what people are voting for, then, you know, that's terrible. I'd hate it. Now, of course, I also do support, uh, let's just say, certain kinds of equality law that would sort of uphold non-discrimination. If the place, say, voted, you know, to discriminate against Jews or black people, you know, I, I would oppose that. I think that goes against 
basic civil rights. Um, so I kind of support liberal democracy, so certain civil rights protections coupled with demo- – but outside of those spheres of, of individual rights that are protected under the law – there should be democratic decision making. Um, so, for example, so if you're teaching that certain groups are inferior, you're not treating groups equally, and that's a violation of civil rights, the equality law. Okay. So, yeah. what do you mean? What do you mean by liberal democracy? I know that's a huge question. Right. Well, there's yeah. democracy, which is majority rule, as opposed to elite or dynastic rule. That's democracy, transfers of power. There's various rules, right? Uh, but the demos, majority of the people have sovereignty. That's democracy. Yeah. Liberalism is rights protections, um, right to freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, um, not to be arbitrarily arrested, etc. These basic rights, uh, those should be protected. Um, and if the majority wants to infringe those rights, they shouldn't be allowed to infringe them. But I do accept that if a society is really illiberal, those rights are going to go. As, as Lukianov would say, right, you need right. to have some kind of a free speech culture to protect it's not enough just to have that First Amendment because it'll get either removed or interpreted away. Well, that's, in one sense, why we have a constitution and states can't make rights that, well, we, I mean, right. I shouldn't say you. We, <laughs> right. Ameri- well, I shouldn't even in the say US. Americans, but yeah. people in the, in the U.S. So it's kind of like a majority rule with certain rights protected. Yeah, that's right. So you know, are you bearish or bullish or you think and you can comment on your experience here in the uk in addition to canada what do you think about the education system uh in terms of its ideological capture particularly university university system k-12 through as well but the university system uh something nobody talks about which everybody should be talking about it's pre-service uh, college of education right you know yeah. teacher training programs teacher certifi- certification programs uh, so i want to know what you think about that and what do you think is the best way to solve the problem of, of capture of educational institutions yeah i mean i think it's a big problem in all western countries i mean if we just i'm just going to pull a few numbers from surveys i've conducted for sure. example if we take schools uh, 18 to 20 year old American kids, um, 90% of them have heard at least one of four or five critical race theory terms like white privilege, unconscious bias, systemic racism. Britain, that number is more like 60, 65%. If you throw in the gender ideology stuff, oh, it's, it's like 95 in the US and yeah. 75 in Britain. So yeah. it is pretty much in every school. Not not every school, but vast majority. Assigned at birth. Yeah, I mean, or that you can choose your gender, that kind of thing, uh, apart from your biological sex. You know, that would be in a majority of of U.S. classrooms. So um, it's really bad. Um, Pause right there. That you can choose your sex would be in the majority of U.S. classrooms. I don't have data for that, but (laughs) if that's true, I wouldn't be even remotely surprised if it were. Then it would be better off if people didn't go to school and looked at a wall. (laughs) <laughs> because right, because you're teaching them bad, you're teaching them things. It is better to not do anything than to learn things that are false. Right. Well, well, except that it's probably just a couple of activists, maybe the principal setting the tone, but it's probably only happening in 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 a spot here and a spot there, in amongst the math and the reading and all these other. So you you wouldn't want to take the whole school down. I mean, it's just that you would but ideally if the majority like, of people are getting that. Yeah, then they're getting something that's just demonstrably false. Right. Right, but but you can't if you can't just the problem is it's a few classes or a few visiting speakers in a whole year, so it's a very small proportion of the total instruction they're getting, but it's very widespread. So lots of people yeah, are getting yeah. a little dose of this stuff or yeah. a certain dose of this stuff. Ideally, what you want solution wise, yeah. What is do you to, do? What do you do? Well, I think you need to target these this specific teaching and you need to have you need to have an administration that is serious so first you need a law britain has a law that says you can't indoctrinate you know you have to teach both sides that doesn't happen now yeah, it, because right. the teachers will say oh well we're just teaching anti-racism or anti-transphobia in other words what they call anti-transphobia is gender ideology right, so what right. you need to do is actually if you had a serious government maybe a Ron DeSantis figure you'd say well here's our 20 page or maybe not 20 page like maybe three or four page definition of what is political and what isn't 
Critical race theory, political. Gender ideology, political. And here's what gender ideology is. Roll out all the terms. That's the level of detail. Then you've got to have an inspectorate that you control with your personnel and that you are checking up on every few months, reporting into parliament or to Congress uh, on progress. And when people are not doing this, then they have to be fired. That's got to be in the press to chill those who might do it. You're going to have a reporting portal now, of course, you've got to treat people fairly. They should have second chances, et cetera. But you have to, that's the degree of focus that you would need. You've got to, I, I couldn't possibly disagree with you more on almost everything you said. But so we've got multiple issues. So you have to create a bureaucracy to yep. make sure these lunatics don't keep indoctrinating people. Right. You, you would have to make sure that that bureaucracy was enshrined or somehow institutionalized and embedded within that structure that have to be a mechanism of enforcement and control. Mm. Even if you waved a ma- I love saying that wave a magic wand is one of my favorite things to say. Even if you could <laughs> wave a magic wand and make that the case, I would argue to you it would be doomed to failure. Why? Because it would be captured by the other side? What would be the reason? No. Uh, good question. No, because I don't, I don't think it would be captured by the other side. But the problem is that you have people, you, you haven't gotten to the source, which is colleges of education, where people are being trained and the ideologies that they're being trained. Paula Freud's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, my, my writing partner, James Lindsay, has written about this pretty extensively. Other people have the Henry Giroux types, the idea of what the purpose of education is. You will have, I hate to use the, the term t- swamp because it's so loaded, but it actually is a kind of, it's a good term. You'd have a kind of, epistemological and political swamp through where, you, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think there are ways for addressing that leg of the stool as well. I mean, it's tricky because it, once you're talking about higher education, you've got academic freedom, so you can't ban or, or set, I don't think you should be setting limits on what can be taught but on the or, or shouldn't be. But on the other hand, you can, I think, defund Select, selectively anything you think is just scholar activism, I think it's legitimate to defund. So if, if the School of Education wants to get its own private donations or cross-subsidize from another part of the, the school, fine. And then you can also have other routes into teaching, let's say, where you don't need a degree. You, you can maybe ha- work experience can stand in for a degree. So you could create these other routes, break up the cartel around the pipeline. So yeah, I mean, you have to, it's a sort of, throw mud at the wall and and it's multi-pronged. You can't just do one. There's no silver bullet. There are entire wings of university architecture that are predicated upon achieving certain political ambitions or in, in to, to be, to be more specific, deconstructing, dismantling systems of power, systems of oppression. Jim, the person I just mentioned talked about, it would be the equivalent of like, bringing an American flag on it and just pulling out string by string. <laughs> um, I saw something on TikTok recently about people who have read Bin Laden's letter and were enamored by it, his letter to the United yeah. States. And it's utterly, utterly insane to me that we have not banned TikTok. The United States has not banned TikTok. We have... A foreign country, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're an enemy foreign country, but they are a competitor. In fact, Reed and I are going to go to Taiwan. Uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about is the quote unquote reunification. But it's utterly insane to me that, uh, and when you look at uh, um, Helen Joyce and, and Abigail Schreier and others, they talk about the TikTok being responsible. It's crazy to me that we let. Th- these algorithms fuel uh, c- conspicuous anti-American propaganda. It's just totally crazy to me. I would like to make you a bet. Okay. And I'd like to put some skin in the game. Right. And I would like to bet you a really nice dinner at a nice restaurant. Okay. So let's say if we can, you don't have to agree to the bet if you don't want to, about what changes we're going to see in six months. Okay. Um, you think it's the end of wokeness? No way. I mean, there's just no way. Let's give a specific thing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give some, <laughs> I'm going to give some specifics. This is the equivalent of giving, giving you odds. This is how confident okay. I am. All of these specific criteria 
each criterion must be met. So all the criteria must be met. So first, I think it's going to be the last straw to fall is going to be the trans thing. That's going to be the last straw to go. And there's some good stuff about Tavistock, and Andrew Doyle has some some good stuff. And do you know Andrew Doyle? Yep. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's great. A good friend of mine. Yeah. Okay, so here's my prediction to you. I predict you're going to see uh, laws against um, hormones and mastectomies given to people under 18. I predict that you're going to see, uh, in the realm of sports, you're going to see more and more, um, not ubiquitous, but you're going to see more and more nearly ubiquitous professional associations banning men, natal men, and women's sports. Uh, I think you I'm going to give you five. Make, make it even, and, and you mm. can adjust these as you want. Uh, you're going to see the scale is going to tip, although not completely, on putting natal men in women's prisons. One thing that you will see is you will see as brain imaging technology and other technologies improve, you're going to, I predict that you're going to see legal uh, measures taken against any form of um, inquiry into uh, race realism or race science. And I predict that you're going to see that commensurate with whatever emerging technology we find. I predict that um, many of the people, this is a much more difficult one to quantify, but people are going to move from claiming systems of of discrimination are entirely responsible for outcomes to claiming that culture is at least some of that. The Ibram X. Kendi uh, stamp from the beginning, basic arguments would be refuted. Yeah. So those I mean, are my, what are yours? Do, well, I, I'm wondering like a couple of, so, so for example, the fire, you know, professors under fire and disinvitation database yes. trend lines. I've, I've seen that, yeah. Um, I think one good test would be, are they going to go back to 2010 and before levels? The numbers of no platformings and firings and incidents. That's great. That would be a, a metric we could look at, a hard number. I don't believe that'll be the case. Um, I'm going to pause you and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to throw something out and feel free to disagree. I think you're right, but there's a huge but there. I think you're going to see a disproportionate number of cancellations. So now they're endogenous to liberals canceling speakers as opposed to being external. I think you're going to see more and more people in the anti-woke space uh, clamoring for cancellations. On, so I think on the anti-Semitism issue? Oh, whatever. Oh, oh, okay. Because there's a certain percentage from the right already. I think it's like 20 or 30 percent. Um, but... If we just take the ones from the left, you know, are those going to go down to the pre-2010 levels Yeah, in six months? And that's one question. The other, the, Another question would be... And then I want your predictions, so... Well, okay, so the other question would be um, white privilege, systemic racism, unconscious bias, yeah. um, gender unconscious separate bias from sex. been in, repudiated, yeah. But those concepts being taught to children in schools... Will the percentage be zero, or or will the percentage be even less than thirty percent? By like, what's the number? Because it's now at like ninety three in 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 the U S. and about seventy five in Britain. So, yeah. where will those numbers be next year? Is a question I I, I might ask. Um, so so your prediction is that they will rise. My prediction is they won't. They are they going to be fall. either un. I don't think they're going to fall. They may go. Could they fall? I would predict no. I mean, if I had to predict, I'd say they might even rise a bit in Britain and stay high in the U.S. Okay. Uh, well, Britain is something else. So I wasn't when I. Okay. Told, okay. So. Okay. Well, only because you're a little bit behind us. Right. You. I don't mean. Yeah. You, yeah. 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 The, no. The, no. The, you're, right. You're, are you a dual I'm Canadian. Citizen? I'm dual Canadian, but yeah, okay. I'm not but, a real Brit. Obviously, I don't sound like one. Yeah. Okay. Um. um I was going to make a joke about tea, but I <laughs> right. won't. But so, so the, my problem with engaging you in that claim is I don't know what kind of date, like I don't know what the data collection would be so how, for how you would assess the claim. Just a, Okay, so survey of like 1,500 
18 to 20 year olds, random sample. What were you taught in, in school? Uh, what have you heard? Have you heard these concepts? Did you hear them? Yeah, I think that that will decrease significantly in six months. I mean, it will be, I think that the more crazy views will be truncated. But white, like how many kids will hear about white privilege uh, from an adult in school? In, you know, that, that, that's, the, I suppose, yeah. a metric we can test in a survey um, Again, difficult to quantify, like difficult to... No, we can, we can quantify it in a survey. See, that's why... Well, then, I mean, I'm not going to do the survey, but that's why, <laughs> right. that's why I gave you like the laws, governing oh, okay. bodies of sports, because we can look at that data. We don't have to do any work for it. Right. Like we can... It's adjudicated for us in a sense. Yeah, and it's cheaper than $10,000. Oh, well, look, yeah. the, fire, the fire data would be easily accessible. Um, okay. And, to, you know, I guess the question is, what, what do you see from the, you know, left against, you know, from the left, number of disinvitations and firing attempts or firings as recorded in the fire database series? Where will that be next year, the next time they do a data point? Oh, there'll be far, far fewer. Uh, but there could be other reasons for that plummeting enrollment. I mean, it couldn't be, it doesn't necessarily yeah. be ca have to be causal. Uh, but, I but mean, will they be at 2010, pre 2010 levels? Um, that's, that's kind of what I, yeah, I think, I think the, well, that might take a little more than six months, but you know, I, I gave a talk at Eaton and uh, recently, and before I gave talk, I had to, everybody had to be vetted and somebody external to the institution told me, you know, they're probably gonna, and P Peterson spoke there too a week before. And he said, you know, they're probably gonna. Uh, there's probably going to be no incident. You're, you're going to be fine. And I said, well, probably, but why would why would I even not be invited? I mean, why would I be disinvited? And he said something really interesting. He's like, because while they're woke, their donors are not woke. And they want to point to you and Peterson and say, well, look, we had these guys here, so we're not <laughs> inhibiting any free speech. We're not. So I think that, that you see that kind of signaling. And when you think about it, that's... I mean, I don't know if that's true. I have no access to anybody in the administration, but a long story. But I am, so if, if, if you want the whole predictive, if you want our bet to boil down to the fire data, I guess now <laughs> it would depend on how expensive the restaurant was, but I'll... I'll All right, we'll cap the, the restaurant. To <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll say you will see significantly less cancellations coming from the left. I'm, I'm somewhat comfortable with that. The only reason I'm not fully comfortable with that is because it's the whole Sun Tzu thing. You know, it's, I think that if people are truly desperate, then they're going to lash out and just try to cancel more. It's a dying g okay. gasp yeah. before the whole thing Because Because I think the trans stuff is the one metric, and you can see it. Because yeah. the other thing I was going to say is if you look at opinion surveys over time, they, yeah. they've all drifted in that, generally in a left or right. So it's very hard to find any indicator yeah. that hasn't moved left, if we, if, depending on how we define that, in the yeah. past 50, 60 year, whatever. Yeah. So the, the momentum is always towards, you know, the weak and against whoever the oppressor group is. Now, the, the trans thing is the one exception. So we've seen shifts, considerable shifts in the direction of, no, we can't have tra you know, trans women in women's sports right. or women's jail. So that has moved in a sort of more, call it classical liberal conservative direction, but particularly on the race. I mean, so for example, DEI budgets, uh, you know, DEI officers in, the, in universities, you know, you know, how much of a drop that would be another thing for our right. bet. Like that we right. could put into the suite. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So you're gonna see uh dramatic decreases in DEI officers, and you're gonna see some places, and I'm not merely talking about Florida, it, virtually eliminate entire DI bureaucracy. Now, depending on who gets in, you're gonna see in at least in the United States, you know, re revision of Title VI, Title IX, you're gonna see some a law change, I predict, but I can't make that prediction in the context of the mm. bet because I don't know who's going to get in. Uh, right, right. So, but I do think that you're going to see radical defunding of DEI bureaucracies. In the universities, in in the blue states as well as the red or just in the red? 
Yeah, um, but I don't think that's going to be through the fall of the th- through the mm. fact that the ideology is falling into ill repute. I think that's going to be the consequence of budgetary constraints and plummeting enrollments. Right. Yeah. I mean, I hope you're right. I mean, I I, I guess my sense is that this is a, a this is a religion that is sort of so central to the being of of so many people. And I think the young people are more marinated in it. And I just think they're going to be pushing up into the system. And so that's one of the reasons I think you make. What I think we're in is a, a wavelet that's come down from yeah, a peak yeah, yeah. in 2020, 2021. And, and I don't think it's going to go all the way down. So, for example, if you look at mention of terms like racist and sexist since mm. 1960, you know, yeah. there's a spurt in the late 60s. They go up and then they come down a bit, settle out. Then there's another spurt in the late 80s, early 90s with political correctness and hey-ho, yeah, Western yeah. Civ has to go, all that. Then it comes down, but it settles at a higher level. Then the late 2010s, up it goes again. And, yeah, and I yeah, kind of, yeah. I suppose I see this more in in those terms that until we unpick some of the taboos around, you know, the, the taboos around racism and sexism and, and to some degree homophobia and transphobia, these are sort of sacred touchstones and there's no real easy limiting principle for these taboos to stretch. Like, oh, hiking's all white's racist. Or, you know, you said Americans, uh, anyone can make it. Oh, that's racist. Or, you know, so there's just, it's, they're unbounded taboos. And until we can really start to say, no, these have to be proportional and they've got to be much more checked by other principles. I don't think we're going to be on top of the problem. So, yeah, so no, I just I, think I agree. Yeah, I can't I, see I, it. I, so. I think I think that's right. I think the last thing to go, if you look at everything with an identity level salience, I think that the last thing to go will be racial issues generally, and um, anything dealing with African Americans specifically. Uh, I wanted to piggyback off something you said about. You use the phrase so central to. I think that's right. These ideas have become so central that they've overridden the uni- the mission of the institution. And they've overridden the mis- mission of the institution to such an extent that profit motive is subordinate to discharging those ideological achieve uh, I- ideological goals. Look at Disney, you know, apparently attendance is down 30% in their parks. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like profit. I mean, at some point, the profit motive does reassert itself to some degree. I wonder uh, if that's true. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't in the case of universities. No, no. I guess the question is they're willing to pay that tax to virtue signal to other institutions. But um, they're killing, I mean, they, they, yeah. yeah, I remember I suggested years ago to my, my dean, I'm not going to say this individual's gender. And this individual thought it was, she, this individual was so upset at the suggestion. I said, look, if you want to have this whole diversity stuff, you can have it. But I'm telling you, this is not going to last forever. This is a, <laughs> you know, it's it's a locura. It's a kind of craziness. It's just not going to last forever. It's it's To say it's a fad does not even begin to characterize it. So I said, well, why don't we have the, the, um, the new brand, Portland State University, the place to go to have difficult conversations or something like that. Right. And sh- but that's an anathema, right? That's almost Let me guess, that didn't go down well. <laughs> oh, my God, didn't go down well. Yeah. So, um, all right, do you have any other predictions? I guess my prediction is, well, I mean, I, I, if I had to make a solid prediction, I'd say, first of all, I don't think woke is, it may go down a little bit more, but I think long term it's actually going to rise i my my prediction would be that culture wars will be a bigger factor in electoral politics in western countries in a generation like i can't say 6 months out you want something shorter term a lot of things can affect the short term all right term. give me um, all right give me predictions it doesn't have to be 6 months give me give me your predictions going forward well i think that that these issues the the, the divide between what i call cultural socialism ie wokeness and either cultural liberalism, equal treatment, enlightenment values, or cultural conservatism, national heroes and monuments, and et cetera, and hi- histories, that conflict is going to be more important in elections uh, going forward. Than economics? or than Not than economics, but more than it has been. And that, that, that issue is going to be more important in sort of det- determining which party you vote for 
and it will be raised by political candidates more. I mean, DeSantis and Youngkin and others are kind yeah. of pioneers, but because a lot of these issues, certainly right now, the electorates divide about two to one against these issues. So they're very yeah. good wedge issues for any right of center politician to go after, especially if the left is trapped. If the left cannot, for example, say what a woman is because the activists will attack you and kill right. you if you if you say what it is, then that hems in the left and it, it provides an opportunity for the right who's willing to, to go there. Uh, or it could be critical race, gender in schools. Um, so I just think this will be a bigger... It, national history is another battleground. Like, are we going to go around self-flagellating and attacking Churchill or the founders or, you know, in Canada, all these people are being so-called associated with the residential school genocide, you right. know, all, this right. whole narrative, right? I mean, I just think these kinds of battles are going to be more important in determining which party you vote for and also political strategy. Whereas in the sort of late 80s, early 90s with political correctness and Afrocentrism and all of that, it never broke into national politics right. the way it is now. So I think that's a, and I think it's a good thing because it's now off campus and it's now something we're debating democratically. Okay. Um, I'm going to make predictions. Okay. Some more predictions. I predict the number of illegal immigrants is going to rise significantly in this country within uh, a year. I predict there'll be no national will to do anything about it. I think there'll be even less of an appetite to have a conversation about it, and the people who will have a conversation about it will be immediately branded on the far right or the alt right. I think that you'll see fairly low levels of criminality for the first year, and then those will rise dramatically. I see the United States uh, uh, debt rising above 33 trillion. I see. Um, I try not to do make predictions about macroeconomic stuff because I certainly because <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't want anybody. I have very strong opinions about those, but yeah. I don't like to put those okay. out because I don't want anybody putting their money on anything I have to say. Because I'm much more comfortable making predictions about things I know. I think uh, I predict that belief among people in the U.S. Um, that we that either the United States is in possession of uh, alien craft or that aliens are visiting us regularly will increase by at least 10, maybe 15 percentage points. Um, I'm starting to think that the substitution hypothesis is true. Are you familiar with that? Immigration? No, the substitution oh. hypothesis, the idea that is one religion like Christianity goes down, another replaces it. Uh, oh, okay. So that in a way what we're seeing with woke is is, is a substitute religion. It's a substitution okay, hypothesis. Okay, that's an interesting argument. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know a number of people make that argument. But, yeah, you know. I, I, uh, I think I coined it, but I'm not sure... Uh, I'm starting to think it's true, you know, as a just a, a data point for that. As far as I know, as far as I know, I'm a little out of that world. I'm All atheist organizations are woke except one, the one uh, Atheist for Liberty. I'm on the board of that organization um, or an advisor or something. I can't remember exactly what, but... Wow, that's interesting, yeah. yeah Although I will say something about this because I did... This is one of these things I did look into with yeah. data, for example, is to say... Is if somebody says that they are religious, are they less likely to, for example, exhibit white guilt or um, or, or or have yeah. be woke on certain positions? And I actually don't find a relationship at the individual level. What what you see is that if you are, say, Christian in the U.S. in terms yeah. of instead of no religion, you're more likely to be Republican. And if it's really Correct. being Republican that is the barrier against woke. But if you are a Democrat or an independent and you are religious, that that doesn't make you less woke than somebody who's an atheist or doesn't have a religion. Right. Um, there's some. There's more right. of an effect in Britain, actually. There's a little bit more. But I think part of part of that's running through. You know, there's most very few people go to church here. It's like maybe five maximum ten percent a week. I think it's more like five percent. But someone who is a non-church attender who says they're Christian identifies with Christian identity, yeah. uh, that person is going to be less woke. But I think that's part of a kind of nationalism. You see, it's not because they're going to church that they're less woke. I think that's uh, that's absolutely yeah. true. There's a schism now in Christianity and overall in the United States and Southern Baptists for the fault line, and that schism is 
those who are caught in the orbit of the ideology wokeness or critical social justice or so, what do you call it social marxism or a, a cultural socialism so, cultural yeah. socialism or whatever one whatever one would want to term it um, well, I just fired a ton of questions at you. And yeah. so do you have any? Do you have anything you want to throw out before we end? Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of those predictions, like the immigration. I guess if I had to predict, I also think that the populist right is going to rise across the West as it did post 2014. Um, so we might see Le Pen win in France, for example. That that the and this is on the back of rising illegal immigration numbers uh, in Europe. Of which Britain is one example. Now, Britain is in a little bit of an odd place because it's had a conservative government in for 13 right, years right, who right. promised to cut immigration and did the opposite. Right, right, so right. they're totally discredited on this issue. But at the same time, also, the, the, the kind of populist right um, challengers are in disarray as well. So it's kind of a very odd case by European standards. Hard to predict, other than I would say that you know immigration will be a bigger issue in six months uh, in this country. Now, I don't think the I don't think the politically correct taboos around discussing illegal immigration are as as strong here as they are in North America, for example. I mean, I don't think people will be shy about no. saying this is a problem. We have to do something about it. Um, and I don't think they'll give up. Actually, yeah. I just don't think they will be able to say, oh, well, we can't stop the boats. They're coming in. I oh, the, oh I, I, well, we have a genuine difference of agreement, okay. a difference of opinion there. We also have a, we haven't talked about the NHS. I think that the resources will be strained tremendously. And as a consequence to fill those coffers, there'll be talk about taxes on rich people or t some other kind of tax that I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the system. There's a really good paper. I don't, um, I'll, I'll get it to you later if you want to text it to you. It's about, um, as uh, societies become more diverse, uh, welfare um, um, resources become exponentially depleted in direct correspondence to the diversity of the society. Uh, in in the sense that people don't want to contribute to the welfare state, or that there's more people on welfare. The 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 latter, okay. and both the former and the latter, because people don't want to give to people who are not like them. But there's yeah. a, it has a corrosive effect on the welfare systems. I think okay. that the NHS in this this country is, I think it'd be interesting to see in a, yeah. politic, I'll say, in a very British way, I'll say, it should be interesting <laughs> to see what happens to it. That's yeah. probably Irish, Scottish, <laughs> nothing. I'm sure everyone's going to freak out. Um, all right, yeah. cool. All right, anything else before we wrap up, man? No, no, just that, that whole debate around diversity and trust, diversity, solidarity. Robert yeah. Putnam at Harvard, yeah, wrote, yeah. you know, he, he got in a certain amount of trouble. Uh, but yeah, he just said there is this relationship that there's a conflict tension between diversity and solidarity. And if you're on the left and you like welfare states and high trust, but you like diversity, you've got to choose one or the other. And and and, and now there's more and more research, certainly at the local level, this is a, a repeated, repeated finding that, that higher local level diversity leading to less likelihood of returning a wallet, less feeling of attachment to community, lower. So there's that social capital, what, what Putin would call social capital decline. Yeah. So, so uh, as Ronald Reagan, I think, said to Mondale, right. there you go again. What I mean by that is you just cited data. The people who hold these positions, they don't give a shit about data. Right. If they gave a shit about data, they wouldn't hold the positions. <laughs> right? So it's never a gotcha. Like when you... when. So that's the, always a fascinating thing when I look online or I talk to someone you know like you is super educated and super smart and 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 they present data and people you know watching this will say like oh wow look at that like you know that's a gotcha for those people that's no gotcha for them no. that they don't accept any it doesn't matter there is no evidence there's no evidence that right. I mean just think about that one thing you said about solidarity versus uh, diversity versus solidarity. Yeah. Um, you don't even need data for that. I mean, you could just right. think through the problem. But right. if you could, if if you have some, if your brain is recalcitrant, you can't think through the problem and you present overwhelming evidence, there are, there's an underlying ideology that informs, that's like a manifestation of that. So th th there yeah. is no data. Well, well, I think you, you, yeah, and you make a really good point there, which is that at the end of the day, and, and also when it comes to trying to push back against this, that are, you can have the best arguments in the world. Yeah. 
if they're attached to this as an identity, as a story, that's correct. Then you're getting nowhere. And I think right. this is the problem: is that progressivism, and this has been the case for quite a while. It's more, much more of an identity, let's yeah. say, than conservatism. I mean, conservatism rests on sort of national identity, religious yeah. identity, but it itself is not a identity the way progressivism is. The progressivism says, you know, we're on the right side of history. Yeah, There's the the positive feeling towards the minority and the negative to the oppressor majority. And we're, we're with the oppressed against the oppressed. I mean, that's yeah. kind of roughly the storyline. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. everything is going to be filtered through that. And no matter what arguments, they'll just be, you know, my side bias will take over. So... I think probably we're going to need some kind of way of getting at the hearts and not just the minds, some kind of story that can compete with that Robin Hood kind of story that is driving the other side. And, and it's probably got a lot of appeal accounts, particularly for young people. Yeah. I'm hesitant. I want to, I want to stop it now because we're over time, but I just want to say, I don't think any, any story is going to, is going to solve it. I don't, maybe you, you would want, want a large scale cultural intervention, but I've been criticized because I believe a solution, I'm not saying it's the solution, but I believe a solution is we need to build new things. We need to, the, the internet, of course, and, and you know, Substack, et cetera, alternative media platforms, um, founding faculty fellow uh, at the University of Austin, that's an example of building new things. Ralston College is already up and running. That's an example of building new things. More colleges... Uh, more educational systems, more diverse media venues and outlets. Unheard would be a great example mm -hmm. of that. It's, it's built new things, but um, yeah, I mean, I put in a word for the University of Buckingham where I moved, cool. which whose leadership is unique in Britain in essentially being a free speech oriented uh, university. Oh wow, that's fantastic! So and I, where yeah. is that? Well, that's just uh, between sort of between Oxford and Cambridge, north of London. Uh, now, most of the university, I mean, it's it's freer than elsewhere, but it's certainly not the University of Austin. There are just a number of different spots and centers that are a bit against the grain, but wow. it's not it's not at the level, it's not as much of a complete institution that's completely moving in the one direction as, say, UATX. It's kind of a mix of a leadership that is very much oriented that way and then a more conventional university cool. attached. Cool, cool. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that because I, I also want to make sure that we get the voices and we, we promote people and institutions that are doing good work to let to let everybody know that there are alternatives and there are places you can go. You don't have to be held hostage to institutional capture. Yeah, oh, and I should say I'm also, I've also got this online course on Woke, which I'm doing... Please. At Buckingham, it'll be the first, I think, university course on woke. Um, oh, fantastic! And it's online, open. So, um, really, is it like a, is it a MOOC? It's like a MOOC, yeah. And if you just you know, if you go to my Twitter, it's kind of the pin tweet. What's your Twitter? It's just at e p k a u f m. Okay. Um, Where else can people find you? Um, well, I've got. If you go to my website, it's s n e p s snaps dot net. Um, there, you can find me as well. Cool. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate you talking to me today. Thanks, thanks. Peter. It's been great. Right on, man. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out. Make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.